ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Dragnet is brought to you by Chesterfield, made by Liggett and Myers, first major tobacco company to bring you a complete line of quality cigarettes. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a robbery detail. A pair of thieves has been terrorizing the merchants in your city. They're described as a man and a woman. From their actions, you know they're capable of murder. Your job, stop them. Today, you hear these three words everywhere. Chesterfield's for me. The cigarette with a proven good record with smokers. Here is the record. Bi-monthly examinations of a group of smokers show no adverse effects to the nose, throat, and sinuses from smoking Chesterfields. Chesterfields for me. The cigarette tested and approved by 30 years of scientific tobacco research. Chesterfields for me. Chesterfield gives you proof of highest quality, low nicotine. The taste you want. The mildness you want. The Chesterfield you smoke today is the best cigarette ever made, and best for you. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Wednesday, July 23rd. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of robbery detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Chief of Detective Stad Brown. My name's Friday. I was on my way back from the main jail, and it was 8.16 p.m. when I got to room 27A. Robbery detail. Hi, Slat. Joe, any word from Frank? Yeah, I talked to Skipper this morning. He said they were having a little trouble with that extradition. Anything big? No, I guess not. Chief Brown said the authorities back in St. Louis would get it straightened out. Frank ought to be back in the middle of next week. Mm hmm Skipper said he wants me to work with you on that liquor store thing. Kathleen and I can use some help. We run down just about every lead there is. They all end up in the same place. Well, I got a little of it. You want to fill me in on the rest? Yeah. Hot shot. I'll get it. You can get it firsthand. Yeah? They just scored again. Sergeant Slats Henry, Tom Gaffney, and I went downstairs to the carpool. We took out our robbery car and we rolled on the call code three. It took us a little over ten minutes to get to the corner of Alexandria and Burns Avenues. The place that had reported being robbed was a small neighborhood liquor store. By the time we'd gotten there, a radio car had answered the call and a felony car from Hollywood Division had gotten there. While Gaffney talked with the men in the felony car, Slats and I went inside the store to see the victim. The uniformed officer who was with him told us that the elderly man's name was Charles Osborne. We got what information the officer had been able to get, and while he went to his unit to get out a broadcast on the suspects, Slats and I talked to Osborne. Well, there isn't much to tell. I guess they worked it the same way they've been doing. Just the way how it tells in the papers. The same. Mm -hmm. There were two of them, were there? Yeah, the man and the woman, two. Might be better if you told us just exactly what happened. Well, just pick up any paper. It's all there. They've been doing the same thing for a couple of weeks. I don't understand it. I don't. What's that, Mr. Osborne? Well, these two just walk into any store and take what they want. You guys don't seem to be able to stop them. You go great guns after they've held up somebody. Then you're great. But where are you when they're doing the robbing, huh? Where are you then? Where? Well, if you'll just calm down here and tell us what happened, we might be able to do something about it. Oh. Well, they come in just like always. About what time was that? Well, it must have been around eight. I was a little too busy to look at my watch. Mm -hmm. Do you want to go ahead? Well, there was two of them, man and the woman. Yes, sir. Man and the woman stood over there at the door. Woman walked right up here at the counter, right up, and stood there. First off, I thought she had a cold or something. Wasn't long that thought held on, though. No, sir, not long at all. Yes, sir. Eh, turned out to be a mask. Handkerchief, you know, right across here. Right here across her face. About that time, of course, I realized there was something was wrong, you know. Anybody walks into a store with a mask off, they don't mean no good. Oh, none. Yes, sir. Did you get a good look at the pair before they put the masks on? No, sir, not at all. No, no. They had them kind of... 
up over their mouths when they come in, kind of like they was going to cough or something. Then they took their hands away, and I could see that the handkerchief was tied right on. Tied. Yes, sir. Do you want to go ahead? Well, this woman come over the counter and asked me for a bottle of Canadian whiskey. Just as calm as can be. I fought right out. Now, mind, you see, all this time I thought she had a cold. Yes, sir. I walked over, you see, there. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. where I keep the Canadian stuff and got a bottle. I see. Got it right down, and I turned around, and there she was, just standing there with a the mask on. Had it tied right around, tied. Yes, sir. What happened then? Well, I asked them what the big idea was. I thought that maybe they was playing a little joke, you see. They was, but it was on me. Woman told me to put the bottle in the paper bag and put the money in the bag, too. Told me to open the register and just put all the money right in the bag. Did you see if they were armed? No wonder you haven't caught them. Sir? You got a life-size picture of me giving them the money if they wasn't armed. You got that kind of idea? No, sir. We just want to know if they had guns. Well, of course they had guns. Did you see them? Well, naturally. Right out in the open. No, 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 no. Wait, 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 wait a second. Come right down to it. I didn't actually see them. The fellow, he was at the door over there. He had his hand in his pocket. She had her hand in a purse, see? Like this. Mm-hmm. You see? Mm-hmm. Like this, kind of... Come right down to it. I didn't really see them, no. But I'm sure they was there. I'm sure. Yes, sir. Well, what happened after the woman asked for the money? Well, her and the fellow just told me not to move for five minutes. Had me to keep real still. Said I wouldn't get hurt if I just took it easy. And they left the store. They walk away from the place? Oh, no, no, sir. They had a car parked right out in front. Right in front. Got into that and roared down the street. I counted to a hundred by ones and then called you. Did the uniformed officer get a description of the car? Yes, yes, I'd give it to him. Right off. All right, Mr. Osborne, if you'd give us a description of the pair. Well, the woman was about, uh, oh, was it maybe five foot three... Around in there, waiting around, oh, 130. Mm-hmm. How about the color of her hair? Red. Just flaming red. Had blue eyes, so I guess her hair really was that color. What color were the eyes? Uh, flaming red. Flaming red. I her, told you that not, before. No, sir, not, yes. her, not her, eye, her yeah, eyes. Yes. Oh, oh, her eyes. Oh, <laughs> I'm all confused here. Well, uh, her eyes were blue. Yes, sir. So that's how I knew that. Yes. Hair was bright red. What was she wearing? Oh, had on a kind of barrette, uh, green... Kind of green coat, red purse, red shoes, low heel. The uh, the front was cut out. Mm-hmm. How about the man? What did he look like? Oh, he's a big one. He must have been around six feet. I I couldn't tell too good because he was standing over there with a the door. Oh, but he was a big one, I tell you. He weighed about 170, maybe more. How about his coloring? Dark. Dark hair, dark eyes. Of course, I couldn't see anything very good. Then he had that mask on. What was he wearing? He had a blue suit on, looked kind of like it was linen. Uh, How about his shirt and tie? White shirt, black tie. Shirt was a button-down collar. Uh, No hat. Did either one of them have any marks or scars that might make it easier to identify him? Not that I could see, no, sir. How about accents? Either of them have any kind of speech peculiarity? No. Exactly what the woman say to you. Do you remember the words she used? Uh Uh-huh. Well, first off, she asked for the whiskey. Said, uh, give me a bottle of Canadian whiskey. Didn't mention any special brand. Mm Mm-hmm. Then when I brought it back, she said, uh, just put it in the paper bag and empty the register in there, too. That's what the woman said. Did the man say anything at all? Well, when it was leaving, he said, stay put, Pop. Stay there for five minutes. You won't get hurt. Those are his words. Exact. I remember them. Mm-hmm. All right, sir. We'd like you to come downtown and check some pictures for us, if you will. Well, I guess it'll be all right. You guys should sure get on the ball, though. It's getting pretty bad. Sir? <laughs> Seems a little silly you can't catch these people right out instead of rushing around locking the door after the horse has been stole. A little late then, seems to me. Yes, sir. Well, they've been pretty lucky. They'll probably try the same thing again. Uh, yeah. We'll try to be there the next time. <laughs> A search of the immediate area failed to turn up anything that might lead to the identity of the thieves. A broadcast had been gotten out to all cars in the city, giving the description of the couple, the automobile they were driving, and the clothes they were wearing. The pair had been operating in the city for the past three weeks. In that time, they'd established a fairly definite method of operation. Two days before they planned to work, they'd steal a car. Then, on the night that they started their operation, they'd pick one of the city's main arterials and start at one end of it. They'd hit three or four stores in the area in a period of half an hour. 
The stolen car would be parked on a side street and the couple would make good their escape. All of the routine efforts had been made to identify them. Due to the fact that a woman was involved in the operation, the state adult authority for women had been contacted for the names of recent parolees. But when these had been checked out, we netted nothing. Because of the circumstances of the M.O., we felt that the first break in the case would come through the woman. The stats office had made several runs and the possibles had been checked out. Results, nothing. Five minutes after we'd left the first victim, we got another call. The pair had hit again, further down on Alexandria Avenue. Oh All right, let us through here, please. please. Officers, let, let us, us through. through. Please. Yeah. You the cop? Yes, sir, that's right. I'm the fellow was robbed. I'm him. Slats, you want to see if you can try to clear the front of the place? Right. Okay. All right, sir, if you'd like to tell us what happened here. Terrible. Most terrible thing that ever happened to me. Yes, sir. I got to have a little something to calm my nerves. Got to. Well, can I get you anything, sir? I don't have to, son. I got all right here. Whole store full of it. Just a minute. Yes, sir. A little brandy, that's what I need. Yeah, Mother's sure going to think I took the little nip just to have it. Going to have to explain the whole thing to her. Imagine me being robbed. Yes, sir. Now, if you tell us what happened here. Yeah. Uh, say, excuse me, you like a little of this? No, sir. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, these two came in here not more than five minutes ago. Man and woman. Came right in and asked for a bottle of whiskey. Mm -hmm. Do you recall what brand? Didn't ask for no special brand, just said they wanted Canada whiskey. Blend. Mm -hmm. You'd be able to give us a description of them? <sighs> well, the woman had red hair, and that's about the only thing I do remember about her, other than the way she talked. How do you mean, sir? Foul mouth. The way she swore at me, just something fierce. What did she say? Oh, just swear words, you know. I guess I didn't get the bottle fast enough for him. She told me to hurry up, only she didn't say it just like that. Where was the man during this time? Oh, he was over here at the cash register with a gun. Was the woman there, too? Oh, no, no, she stayed over by the door. Seemed to be the lookout or something. She didn't come much past uh, uh, there, mm -hmm. right there by the potato chip rack. That's about as far as she come. Mm -hmm. And you said they used guns. Did you get a look at them? Oh, yeah, big ones. I guess they must have been that long, and the barrel must have been that big round. Mm -hmm. What kind of a gun was it, would you know? I don't think I know what you mean. Or was it an automatic or a revolver? And I'm sorry, officer, but I don't understand. All I know it was the biggest gun I ever saw. Must have been that long, that big around. <laughs> Did it look like this one? Oh, no. No, that's just a pea shooter compared to the one that fellow was waving around. Mm -hmm. Did you see a car when they left? Yes, I did. Right out in front it was. Parked in front of the sign. Hey, you see there where it says reserved for patrons? Yes, sir. Uh, right there. That's where the car was. After the fellow told me to dump the cash into the paper bag with the bottle, the woman opened the door, and both of them ran out and jumped into the car. Roared off down the street. But I got a good look at it. Real good. Mm -hmm. Then you can give us a description of it? You bet I can. Dark, 1953 Ford sedan. Four-door. Had one of them sun things on the front. You know, like a shade. Yes, sir. Used to have them on the buggies when I was a young man. <laughs> Guess if you wait long enough, they get back to everything. Yes, sir. How much money did they get away with, sir? Oh, I guess it must have been around $225, round in there someplace. Give a couple, take a couple. Mm -hmm. Do you think you'd know either one of these people if you ever saw them again? No, you just bet I would. Even with those masks on, I'd be able to pick them right out of a crowd. You just stand them up in front of me and I'll point them out. I'll never forget that gun. Biggest gun I ever saw. Must have been that long, that big around. That one you got there is a real pea shooter. Mm -hmm. How's it look, Joe? Well, it's the same couple. Description fits perfectly. I checked around the people in the crowd, found one old guy who says he saw the pair come out of the store. Got a good description of the car. Uh -huh. I already gave him one. I can tell you anything you want to know. Yes, sir, we appreciate that, but we do want to talk to everybody who knows anything about the holdup. All right. You go ahead and talk to the other fellow. You go right ahead. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah, but I got something he can't give you. What's that, sir? License number of the car they drove. <laughs> An immediate supplementary broadcast was gotten out to the cars in the area with special attention to the units covering Alexandria Avenue. The search for the pair of thieves went on, but as the hours passed and they failed to hit again, it became apparent that they had eluded us again. The next morning, the car was found abandoned on the east side of Los Angeles. It was a stolen vehicle, and after it had been checked for the crime lab for latent prints, we were no further toward apprehending the suspects. Conference was held with the chief of detectives, Thad Brown, and it was decided to place an extensive stakeout on the liquor stores in the Hollywood area. From past performances, the pair seemed to work their operation in that general area more than the other parts of town. The stakeout was maintained for three days without results. 
On Tuesday night, July 29th, Sergeant Henry and I waited in the squad room for reports from the other officers out in the field. 1.15 a.m. Well, looks like another night shot. Yeah, still no action. Stores will be closing in about 45 minutes now. Yeah. You got a cigarette? I'm out. Yeah. I think there's a couple left in here. Yeah, just two. Here, go ahead. I'll go down the hall and get a couple of packs well, later. That's all right. Here. <sighs> Heard from Frank? No, I talked to Faye night before last. She got a letter from him. Said he thought he'd be back about the end of the week. See how it's going? No, he just read me a couple parts of the letter. I guess it's all straightened out. Suspect's coming back on his own. Well, extraditions can sure be a pain. I had to go back to New Orleans on one last year. Had a miserable time. Guy gave us a lot of trouble. Yeah, I remember. I get it. Now, let's go. They just hit again. In the stakeout area? No, out in Highland Park. They're way out on this one. What do you mean? Well, the victim decided to give him a little trouble. Yeah? The male suspect broke off the bottom of a whiskey bottle and worked the victim over. Mm -hmm. Almost killed him. You are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. Chesterfields for me. You hear it everywhere. A brand new survey of campus cigarette dealers at 274 leading colleges and universities shows Chesterfield the largest seller. Nobody knows it better than America's number one band leader, Ray Anthony, who plays college dates coast to coast. Here is Ray with his attractive wife, Dee. In cigarettes, the young crowd really goes for Chesterfields. I've noticed that wherever we've played. And I guess it's one of the reasons Chesterfield is America's most popular two-way cigarette. Of course, Dee and I are Chesterfield smokers, too. We know they're best for us. Chesterfields for me. You hear it everywhere. The Chesterfield you smoke today is the best cigarette ever made. And best for you. At 1.13 a.m., the pair of thieves had entered a small all-night grocery store in the Highland Park area. They'd gone through the usual part of their M.O., asking for the bottle of Canadian whiskey and then the money. However, when they asked the victim to turn over the money to them, he had told them to get out of the store. The male member of the team had grabbed the bottle, hit it against the counter, breaking off the bottom, and then struck the victim several times about the head and shoulders. When we'd gotten the call, the man had been removed to Georgia Street Receiving Hospital, where he was in a critical condition. An immediate search of the area had failed to turn up anything that might lead us to the apprehension of the man and woman. A citywide broadcast was gotten out on the pair, and arrangements were made for their description to be broadcast on the police television program. Newspapers carried the stories and joined with us in asking for full cooperation from the public. For the next three days, we received several calls with information on the suspects, but when all of these were checked and sifted, we were right back where we started. The stakeouts were maintained on the liquor stores, but the suspects failed to hit again. On Monday, August 4th, we got a call from the county hospital telling us that the latest victim was in condition to be interviewed. Slats Henry and I drove over to see him. He was unable to tell us anything more than the dozen victims before him had told us. 3.15 p.m., we went back to the office. Want to check the book? Yeah, I'll get it. Yeah, there's a message here that a Reese McKay called. He left a number. Say what he wanted? No, he just wants us to call. This table, we gotta put something under this leg. It sure wobbles, doesn't mm -hmm. it? Been that way for years. Yeah. I'd like to speak to Mr. Reese McKay, please. My name's Friday, Los Angeles Police Department. No, Police Department. Yes, yeah, surely. It's the attorney's office. Uh, yes, sir? Mm-hmm. This is Sergeant Friday. Yes, sir. Certainly. When was this? Mm-hmm. All right, sir. No, we'll be right over. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Oh, might be something. What'd he say? Woman was in his office this afternoon. Yeah. Said something about being involved in a robbery. <laughs> Sergeant Henry and I signed out of the office and drove over to the address the lawyer had given me on the phone. We waited in the reception room for a few minutes, and then his secretary ushered us into Mr. McKay's office. Come in, gentlemen. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. I'm Reese McKay. Yes, sir. This is Sergeant Henry. My name's Friday. Oh, yes. You're the gentleman I talked to on the phone. That's right. Well, sit down, and I'll try and tell you what happened. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. You've got to realize my problem in this thing. Yes, sir. What's that? 
Well, if this isn't anything worthwhile, I certainly don't want to have a client embarrassed. You can understand that. Yes, sir. Well, suppose I just tell you what happened, and we can go on from there. All right, that'll be fine. A couple of days ago, I got a call from a young woman who said she wanted me to handle a divorce for her. Mm-hmm. Well, we set up an appointment for her this afternoon. She came in, and we went over the problem. Uh, I don't want to go into the detail of the divorce action. I don't think that'll have any bearing on the rest of it. All right, sir. Well, to get to the short of it, we were going over the necessary information. The door burst open, and this man came in. Mm-hmm. I wanted to know what it was all about. My secretary was right behind him, seeing that he just pushed his way right through the reception room. Well, who was he, do you know? Well, he said he was the woman's husband. Is that true? Well, apparently, I told my secretary to wait outside, then I asked him what he wanted. He didn't pay any attention to me at first, said it wasn't any of my concern, told me to keep my nose out of it. Mm Mm-hmm. Then he and the woman had a big discussion. Seems that he didn't want her to divorce him, made all sorts of promises how things would be different if she came back to him. Mm Mm-hmm. At first, she seemed to go along with the idea. As you know, we, uh, we like to effect a reconciliation wherever possible. So I told them to go ahead and talk it over. Mm-hmm. Well, I left them in the office and went out of the reception room, and for a while it seemed they were getting along all right. Then the shouting died down, and they seemed to have agreed. And all of a sudden it broke loose again. They started to scream at each other, and I went right back in the office, and just as I opened the door, I heard the man tell her that if she didn't come back, he'd cause her a lot of trouble. Mm-hmm. He said for her to remember that she was mixed up in the holdups too, and these were the exact words. Don't forget, you're mixed up in those stick-ups as deep as me. I see. When they saw me, they both quieted down, and a couple of minutes later they... Both left the office. The woman said she'd get in touch with me about the bill. Certainly something that should be looked into. Yes, that's what I thought. That's the reason I called you. Can you give us the name and address of the couple? Yes, sir. I have it right here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Pretty difficult to imagine that she'd be involved in anything like that. Pretty woman, beautiful hair. Is that right? Yes, flaming red. We obtained the address the woman had given Reese McKay, and we checked her name through R&I. We found no criminal record on anyone answering her description. While Slats called Chief Brown and told him what had happened, I asked the record division to make a run on the husband. We found that he'd been arrested three years before for attempted armed robbery, but that he'd been released for lack of evidence. 5.40 p.m., Slats and I drove over to the woman's address. The name on the mailbox in the apartment lobby read Mr. and Mrs. George Winston. We rang the bell and we identified ourselves. You want to come in? Thank you very much. Is there anyone else here, ma'am? You mean in the apartment? Yes. No, I'm alone. Where's that door lead, ma'am? Bedroom. You mind if we take a look? Maybe you better tell me what this is all about first, huh? You better go ahead, Slant. Yeah. I suppose you're used to hearing that you've got a lot of nerve. Yes, ma'am. Well, it's true. What's this all about? Isn't there some law that says you've got to make a complaint or something? Where's your husband? That bum. Where is he? I don't know, and I don't care if I never see him again. Nothing but trouble did I ever get from him. Miserable man. Mm-hmm. You haven't any idea where he is? No. I don't think I'd tell you if I did until you let me know what this is all about. What's your husband do for a living, ma'am? You guys are so interested in him, why don't you ask him yourselves? Place is clean, Joe. Mm-hmm. I told you that going in. What's this all about? Now, come on, tell me or get out. We understand you and your husband had an argument this morning. Two of you mentioned something about a robbery. Oh, I understand it all now. Now it's all real plain. Look, what George said was a joke. That's all just a joke. He didn't mean anything by it. The way we got the story sounded pretty straight. You got it a little mixed up. Well, maybe you better come downtown and tell us all about it, huh? What for? Well, we've got some people down there we'd like you to meet. I got enough friends. Well, then let's put it down that these people would like to meet you. Do you want to get your coat? I think there's supposed to be something like a charge, isn't there? Yes, ma'am, that's the way you want it. I do. All right, suspicion of robbery. What makes you think you can make it stick? Well, we wouldn't be taking you in if we didn't figure we had a case. You'd save all of us a lot of trouble if you'd tell us where we can pick up your husband. What's in it for me? What do you got now? Nothing. Well, that's the best we can do. What makes you think you can hold up this kind of a charge? A dozen victims, for one thing. Slats, you want to check the closet, see if you can find a green coat and the red shoes and purse? Yeah. What happens if I've got a green coat? Well, it makes us look pretty good, doesn't it? A lot of girls got green coats. Yeah, we're looking for one. She's supposed to look like me? Description we got matches exactly. A lot of people in the world look like me. Same people who have green coats. Mm-hmm. Got them, Joe. Found them up on the shelf in the closet. Take a look. They match what we heard. Yeah, would you like to try this coat on, Miss Winston? Then we can get going. Okay, but you guys are sure going to find out that you're wrong. Is that right? You just bet, and it's going to cost the city a lot of money because I'm really going to make a big thing out of this. Well, if we're wrong, we'll admit it. Then you admit you could be making a mistake. No, we don't. I read in the papers where there was an old guy beat up in a robbery... Same ones you're after me for? Might be, yeah. How's he doing, the old guy? Well, we're not sure yet. He's going to live, though, isn't he? I told you, Miss Winston, we're not sure. You got a cigarette? Yes, ma'am, here. 
Yeah. I want you to tell me something. Tell me true. What's that? You really think you can put me in those stores? Yes, we do. I can't make a deal, huh? You know, tell you things and have it go any easier? No, ma'am. All we can do is see that it's marked down that way. Best I can get? That's the best. I'll take it. What? I'll tell you about it. I'll tell you the whole thing. All right, go ahead. Well, you got the right people, me and George. I knew when he hit that old man we'd had it. Knew it right away. That's why we quit. I was afraid. If the guy died, you'd be able to get us for murder. I didn't like the robbery part, but I didn't want any part of a killing. I never did like the setup. Never. I used to tell George I didn't like it. That didn't make any difference to him. He wanted to be the big man. He used to sit here after hitting the places. George would get the morning papers and sit here and laugh at the cops because he had them running after themselves. You know where he is? Yeah. He's in a hotel down on West 7th, using the name Evanston. I'll give you the address. All right, let's go. Yeah. <laughs> oh, George. He's going to be real surprised when you walk in on him. Real surprised. Sure wish I could see the expression on his face when he finds out what's happened. Sure like to see it. Well, that makes you even, doesn't it? Huh? He'll want to see yours. The story you've just heard is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On November 17th, trial was held in Department 98, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. Friends, we've told you that Chesterfield is the best cigarette for you to smoke. Now, to me, Chesterfield's record with people who do smoke them regularly backs up that statement. Chesterfields are best because they're highest in quality, low in nicotine, because they smoke mild and they're really satisfying. I wish you'd give them a try and see for yourself. America's most popular two-way cigarette. Regular or king-size Chesterfield. Best for me, best for you. Geraldine Ruth Winston and George Roland Winston were tried and convicted of robbery in the first degree, five counts. They received sentence as prescribed by law. Robbery in the first degree is punishable by imprisonment for a period of not less than five years in the state penitentiary. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Vic Perrin, Herb Ellis, Vic Rodman. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. Watch an entirely different Dragnet case history each week on your local NBC television station. Please check your newspapers for the day and time. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet, transcribed from Los Angeles. Filter tip smokers, this is it. L and M filters, the one filter tip cigarette with plenty of good taste, much more flavor, much less nicotine, and effective filtration. Only the L and M filter contains the miracle product alpha cellulose, absolutely pure, non-mineral, harmless to health. Yes, this is it. As Barbara Stanwyck puts it, L and M filters are just what the doctor ordered. Buy L and M filters, the light and mild smoke. <laughs> Here, Rocky Fortune, following John Cameron Swayze and the news on the NBC radio network.